And microscopy, in its own right, is a research area. There are people who develop new microscopy techniques. Now, I'm not one of them. For me, microscopy is a tool, and it's a tool that's used by just about every stripe of scientist you can think of. Right back in the 15th century, Robert Hooke, the first great microscopist, he was an ugly little man, but he made beautiful microscopes. And with those microscopes, he drew beautiful illustrations. He published a work called Micrographia and gave the world for the first time pictures of fleas and needles and pieces of cloth, but drawn in the most beautiful detail and seen in detail that had never been seen before. He actually is the reason that we call cells cells, you know, the cells that we're made up of, the cells that plant matter is made up of. He was looking at a piece of cork and the structure that he saw through the microscope that had never been seen before, he thought looked like the little rooms that monks lived in in a monastery, and so they became called cells, and that's how we've got that word. So microscopy is pervasive throughout science. So the important term when we come to microscopy isn't magnification per se, it's actually resolution. Now, the idea of resolution has a very strict definition, and it's basically the smallest gap that you can see that where two separate features are seen separately rather than with blurry overlap. And the mental shorthand for that, you can think of resolution as being the smallest thing you can see with a microscope. So... Light microscopes, such as Robert Hooke used, such as we use every day in science, they have a resolution of around about 200 nanometers. So let me say that's, <clears throat> in biological terms, you can see pretty much most bacteria at 200 nanometers. You can see many viruses, <laughs> well, some viruses. Some vi in geological terms, maybe you'd be able to see um, the details of a diatom. In metallographic terms, such as I might use, um, that would allow you to sh see the grain structure of a metal, which would then influence its properties at a macroscopic scale. So that's 200 nanometers. Now, everyone thought that was the limit for light microscopes, but now the physicists have played around and broken all these strange quantum physics rules. And now light microscopes can actually resolve things that are 20 nanometers. And if you push that a little bit further, you get into the electron microscope realm, which is pretty much where I live. Now, I'm lucky. I look after scanning electron microscopes, which are easy. But the ultimate electron microscope is the scanning transmission electron microscope, or STEM. And that has a resolution of 0.07 nanometers. So that's sub-angstrom. That's individual atom stuff. With one of those microscopes, you can put in a piece of material and you can see individual atoms. You can see where the atoms are meant to be. You can see the atoms that are missing. You can see the faults in the material. And it's often those imperfections that actually give the material its properties, its behavior. So those microscopes are astonishingly powerful. They're also astonishingly expensive. So that huge price tag begs two main questions. The first question is a science question. Do we need that level of resolution? Do we need to see individual atoms? Has the pursuit of this really, really high resolution come at a cost of losing an appreciation of lower resolution, more accessible microscopes? Some of the most convincing um, research into the authenticity or otherwise of the Shroud of Turin and the Vinland map. The most convincing research to date was conducted by an American fellow called Walter McCrone. He didn't use an electron microscope, he didn't use fancy spectroscopic techniques, he used a polarized light microscope which you could buy for a couple of thousand dollars. That's the most convincing evidence to date. Incidentally, he feels they're both forgeries. So there's some interesting questions on science as to whether the pursuit of this ultimate high resolution is worthwhile. If you take it to its logical conclusion, the wavelength of electrons is measured in picometers. So there's your resolution limit for an electron microscope, right down at the picometer level. That's 20 times better than we've got at the moment, and it's not even on the horizon. But there's people chasing it. So do we need to see things at that level of detail? That's one question. That's the science question. 
The other question is possibly slightly different for Café Scientifique. This is a question of who pays for these instruments. These things, if they're going to cost $10 million and another $10 million to build a lab to put them in, who bears that cost? Now, the government rec <coughs> recognised that possibly this was a slight hole in our funding environment. Maybe we should address it. And as such, formed what's called the Research Infrastructure Advisory Group, or REAG. Now, REAG was exactly what it said. It was an advisory group. No more, no less. They conducted a scan of the New Zealand science scene. And they went around to everybody and they said, what do you want? How much do you want? What's it going to cost? What pieces of kit are going to allow you to do your science? And they came up with a five-year investment plan of around about $250 million that REAG considered key essential equipment to preserve the vigour of the science landscape in New Zealand. The government has yet to act on a single one of REAG's recommendations. And other countries have got similar entities. In Australia, you have a, an organisation called NCRIS, which stands for the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy. Possibly the important word there is strategy, because NCRIS had a budget. They had a budget of 541 million Australian dollars to spend as they saw fit, 49 million of which went into microscopy. So how do we compete with that? How does New Zealand, a small, relatively poor, relatively low-tech country compete with $541 million of funding to buy these big shiny toys? And more to the point, do we want to compete? Is that the right thing to do? If we looked at what $3 million, let's say $3.7 million for sake of argument, could buy at the moment, it would buy you a fairly nice transmission electron microscope. It would also buy you an awful lot of flights to Australia to use an electron microscope that's 10 times as powerful. What's the best way to do it? What's the best way for New Zealand scientists to access this really expensive kit? Now, we've got a lot of options. RCSMS, my little research centre, it's got some unique equipment in it, but it's not unique in intent. There are a lot of microscope centres in New Zealand. And I've got a couple of SEMs, somebody else has got a TEM, somebody else has got some very nice laser microscopes. But we're, we're diverse, we're, across the, we're dispersed across the country. Is it time for New Zealand to say, well, we can't afford that? We can't afford every academic to have access in the room next door to a fairly low-tech piece of equipment? Is it going to be more efficient? to amalgamate everything. What's best, a low-tech piece of equipment right next door, a slightly higher-tech piece of equipment, a train ride away? No, gosh, no trains in the country, sorry. <laughs> a car ride away. Or a, or a state-of-the-art facility, a plane ride away. And once you're flying between islands, well, there's Australia. So there's a lot of questions there. And what came home to me particularly today, I was having a discussion with an academic, and I'm based in the engineering faculty at the university, and he's based in the engineering faculty at the university, and he was using a particular light microscope um, called a confocal laser scanning microscope. And he said, oh, yes, we go up to the med school to use theirs, but I've put in a, a, a CapEx application to the university to buy ours so we can have one. And I thought to myself, well, why? The ones in the med school are fabulous. Hilary Holloway, who runs them, is a complete star. She can make them sing and dance. Why would you buy your own? But I didn't say that. I just smiled sweetly. So that's a nice idea. Good luck. <laughs> so what is, the, what is the best way of doing this? How do, we, how do we get over this academic mindset of, I want my toys? You know, there's that saying, you know, whoever dies with the most toys win. Well, whoever dies with the most toys is still dead. So maybe it's time we, um, we learn to share our toys, possibly a little bit better. As I said, microscopy... It's really just a little Trojan horse there to, to think about research infrastructure, but of course my first love is microscopy. And I'll just end possibly on that comment because it's, um, microscopy is, is, is as much my hobby as it is my job. I love microscopes, there's no two ways about it. Some of the most beautiful sculptures in the world, right there in a grain of sand, you just need to look at them. So I'll stop there. Thank you.